The Bible has been described as many things throughout the ages. Inspired, inerrant, trustworthy, authoritative, sacred, oppressive, outdated. Depending on who you ask, this book is seen as the most holy and sacred of books, or it's just an outdated piece of propaganda. The words of this sacred text have been used to justify almost anything under the sun, from slavery to the oppression of different people groups to wars or voting for a particular political candidate. I can't tell you how many times I've heard in the middle of a heated discussion, well, the Bible says it, and that just ends the discussion. When people have that sort of attitude, it's never meant to edify or encourage healthy debate, but often it's used to quote a particular line from scripture pulled out of context and used as indisputable proof why one person is wrong and the other person is right. It always has this way of ending conversation. Such a random verse pulled out of place with such authority and decisiveness. There's no room for discussion. That's my way or no way. And it breaks my heart to see this beautiful book, this love letter from God, used to hurt and tear people down rather than to connect and bring us closer to God. It breaks my heart when it's weaponized against one another to show why I'm right and you're wrong. It misses the complex relational nature that's contained within the Bible, this beautiful gift that we've been given, a a glimpse into God's heart, an invitation to know and be known by the God of all creation. Scripture, in reality, is a lot of different things. It's stories, it's inspiration, it's metaphor, it's instruction and prophecy and historical account. I don't think it's some sort of rule book put together to prove our own point of view, to help us feel morally superior to those around us. It seems like that's what it comes to a lot of the time. So we're going to be spending the next month or so looking at the particular forms that the Bible takes and the purpose of these different pieces of literature that we've been entrusted to and that's been bound into what we know as the Holy Bible. Discovering the original form and intent of this particular book that has been loved by billions throughout the millennia. And through these pages... Together, my hope is that we will meet the living God in a new way and find ourselves in the story of God's people. This series is largely inspired by Rachel Held Evans' book called Inspired, Slaying Giants, Walking on Water, and Loving the Bible Again. If this is a topic that um, you're curious about, it's a fantastic book. She talks about her conservative upbringing and how her views of the Bible have changed throughout her lifetime and um, how she has drawn inspiration and fallen in love with scripture again. So I'd encourage you to pick it up if you haven't read it already. And throughout the book, she looks at different types of scripture, different types of stories that are contained within it, um, the forms that these stories take, and what they communicate to us as God's people. Because of this, we recognize that the point of reading the Bible isn't just to know more about the Bible. You know, to become a pastor, there's a, the very first test you have to take to become a Presbyterian t- pastor is the Bible content exam, which we eye leveling refer to as like a Bible trivia. And it's the most minute details of the Bible. That's really not the point for me of reading the Bible. The point is to fall in love with God and to feel God's love on your life to drawn into this story of God's people since the beginning of time. And so we're going to begin today by looking at what the Bible has to say about itself and how that interpretation, um, that lens that the Bible gives us of what the Bible believes about itself and how the Bible is meant to be used, helps us interpret God's word today. I'm going to share with you a passage found in 2 Timothy 
written by the Apostle Paul um, shortly after Jesus died and was resurrected. Paul is offering encouragement to an early group of Christians who are seeking to follow Jesus' teachings in a world that was radically different to the way Jesus taught them to live. And so he offers the following words of encouragement to them to lean into scripture for instruction and guidance as they sought to engage God's work in the world. I think these words are enlightening for us today. And so I invite you to hear them today. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have known sacred writings that are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. What a great description of what scripture is meant to be, that it is inspired by God, that it's literally the word in Greek is God breathed like how the breath of God moved over the formless void in creation and brought the world into existence, or how God breathed life into Adam and Eve, or that the breath of God moved over the people in the winds of Pentecost. That scripture, this breath of God, is useful for teaching and for reproach, correction, training, so that we, God's people, could be equipped for every good work that God has called us to. So different than what I ordinarily think of when I think of what this book is meant to do. And I think part of the challenge we have in understanding the Bible is that we want it to be something that it is not. It's not a black and white rule book with step-by-step instructions on how to live a good life or have a happy life. It's not irrefutable fact that's easy to understand and that everybody agrees about. It is a guidebook of sorts, but it is nowhere near as straightforward as we'd like it to be most days. And it's anything but simple. Even this passage, which is contained in what we have as scripture today, is difficult to understand. The Apostle Paul says that all scripture is God-breathed. But what scripture is he referring to? Because he didn't have this book. All he would have had was what we know of as the Old Testament today. Surely he wasn't thinking that the words that he was writing in a letter to a community that he loved and cared for or on the same par to the scriptures that he grew up memorizing and studying. Which books of the Bible are God-breathed? Is it only the ones that made it into the Bible we have today? Because this list of books wasn't assembled until 400 years after Jesus walked the earth. To say nothing of the different versions of the Bible that we have today, We see in the original versions, the earliest versions of these books that used to just be individual letters or books copied by hand over and over again, that there'd be small changes to the words or the syntax, errors in handwriting over the centuries, creative interpretations about what different words meant in their context and the context that they were originally written in. When the Apostle Paul says that all scripture was inspired by God or God breathed, does that mean that God only inspired the scriptures in their original language? Or is our English Bible today inspired? And if so, which English version is the most inspired? What about the 2,000 other languages that the Bible has been translated in? Are those God-breathed as well? What about the crazy things that the Bible does say? There are verses that 
advocate for slavery or say women should have their head covered in church or that you should pillage one's enemies after war. How much of the original context of these verses should we take into account as we're trying to apply these inspired, God-breathed words on our lives today? I found that my understanding of the Bible has changed greatly over the years. As a young believer, the Sunday school stories filled me with awe and wonder. You know, the young David slaying the, the giant Goliath with a pebble, and Jonah living in the belly of a whale, or Daniel taming lions. These biblical characters felt bigger than life. They were real life superheroes that I aspired to be as I wrestled with my own lions in life. In college, I attended a conservative youth group where the Bible became sort of a rule book for how I should act, and it gave strict guidelines, so my youth pastor said, on how long my shorts should be so that I would be modest and how long and late it would be appropriate to stay out on a date with a boy without um, causing myself to sin. In college, the Bible provided to me clear rules to follow, and I knew for certain if I was pleasing or displeasing God. As a young adult, the Bible became much less clear-cut for me. And as I read more of the Bible myself and encountered these stories that just didn't make sense, there were many rules contained in these pages that seemed incompatible with my understanding of God as a just and loving God. It was God really care if we eat shellfish or not? Um, what about God's command that we shouldn't wear mixed fabrics? Would guess that most of us have some article of clothing that's polyester on today, which is a biblical no-no. I discovered that far from being clear-cut, that you could argue almost anything from the Bible. And it wasn't always as easy as I'd been told to know which side was right. Now I find the Bible to be much more nuanced, that so much care and thought needs to be given to how we understand some of these difficult passages in Scripture. The cultural context, both in the day that they were written and the day that we live in now, are so important to how we interpret this inspired text that we've been entrusted with. I find the Bible to be a good conversation partner, that I can interpret various stories and verses in the context of this overarching theme of God's love that runs through every single page of the Bible, and that it's helpful to interpret the most difficult of these passages within the context of you all, of other people who are seeking to know and love Jesus that it's needed to have different opinions and perspectives as I am trying to understand what is not always a clear-cut um, piece of scripture, that together, through conversation and prayer, the true purpose of scripture comes more into focus and I'm able to be more faithful to how God is calling me to live. This dialogue with scripture and around scripture is an ancient practice that was embedded within the Jewish faith that saw scripture as a starting point of a conversation, that through rigorous push and pull with one another, that they would have a fuller understanding of God's purposes and love. And I love that today within our Presbyterian tradition, we don't all have to believe the same thing about scripture in order to belong that it is through these differences and different perspectives and different experiences in life that we teach one another what this inspired text has to say for us and wrestle together with these difficult passages as we seek to understand what they might say to us today. And the passages in the Bible do contradict each other at times, or seemingly so, there are many passages that say women should remain silent in church, and yet here I am. There are others in scripture that say women were leaders and apostles in the early church, that they played an important role, 
There are passages in the Bible that say that the Israelites should smash the babies of their enemies on rocks. And that goes in direct contradiction to Jesus' teachings on forgiving your enemy and God's promise to bless all of creation. Or what about Jesus' command to gouge out your eyes or cut off your hands if they cause you to sin? You'd think that if this was meant literally, that we'd see a whole lot more blind, no-handed Christian followers walking around. And yet, even in Jesus' day, people didn't take this literally. Or even the fact that we have two completely different creation stories contained at the very beginning of our Bible. The first one says man and woman were created on the sixth day by God and God breathed life into them, followed immediately by a second story that says God made man and from the rib of man, woman was created. They both can't be factually true. So what truth do they each convey? The reality is scripture is 100% true but it never claims to be 100% literal. In our passage today, God breathed into the text that it is sufficient for teaching and for good works. It doesn't say that it is factually accurate for this to be true still. The Bible is meant to inspire us to draw us into the story of God's love and then send us out to the world to share that love with others. I think often we confuse this idea of inspiration with this concept of inerrancy. Its core inerrancy means that the Bible is correct, that it communicates what God intends it to communicate, that it does what it says, it teaches and edifies and inspires. And this is true. But I think often we push inerrancy farther, and we think that means that the Bible has to be 100% factually correct in order to be true. That each and every verse can be pulled out of Scripture all by itself, a few words, and those few words will 100% mean what God meant us to understand. This, I don't think, is always true. Scripture is not that black and white. And honestly, I don't ever think that Scripture was meant to be this kind of rule book. It was meant to teach us about God and to find ourselves in the story of God's people. But it was meant to inspire us the way that a sunset inspires us or gazing up at the night sky inspires us. Yes, it's true by studying the stars that we can fall more in love with the heavens, but there's still something that takes our breath away when we look up and see the Milky Way spanning the sky. So much more than the sum of parts or the math or the science that explains it. That there is something that calls us to become something bigger than ourselves, that's awe-inspiring and takes our breath away. And it's the same way with Scripture. You know, different parts of Scripture were meant to be read and understood in different manners. Just like you know what to expect when somebody starts a story with Once Upon a Time, or you adjust your expectation when an article begins with the Associate Press reports. One inspires imagination and wonder, while the other is meant to be a factual account. But both can convey true things about God and true things about our world, even though they speak to us in different ways. When you look at scripture, scripture breaks down into all sorts of different genres of writing. Metaphors about God that teach us things too big for facts to understand. Poetry that stirs the soul. Letters that encourage and teach. Historical records that inform us. Parables that stretch our understanding of God and 
put into words something that is far too big to be put into words. In her book, Rachel Held Evans speaks about these different categories of scripture and the different roles they play in our lives. And she says one of the primary purposes of scripture is to tell us where we come from, who we are. And she says scripture is filled with these origin stories of our beginning. We have the creation story, the story of Abraham and Sarah, the ancestors of our faith. We have Jesus who calls us children of God. The Bible tells us who we are and whose we are so that we can find ourselves in this story that is bigger than ourselves. One story in particular that she highlights is that of Jacob. And it happens very early on in the Bible. Jacob is part of this chosen family of God that God promises to bless and make more numerous than the stars in the sky. But Jacob is the younger brother, so he is second in line for God's blessing. Yet somehow he manages to swindle his brother Esau out of his inheritance and trick his father into giving him his birthright, this blessing that was due to the oldest son. And because of his trickery, Jacob becomes the one whom Jesus' family line is traced through. And on the way back home to beg his brother's forgiveness, he finds himself alone in the desert, wrestling with this unnamed man. And Jacob recognizes that this man is no ordinary man, so he asks for his blessing. And he refused to let go until he gave it to him. The man pushes back and asks for his name. He said it was Jacob, which literally means scoundrel or cheat, a name that he had earned throughout his lifetime. And the man says to him, you should no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, because you have striven with God and with man, and you have prevailed. And in that moment, Jacob's identity was changed. He was given the name Israel, which literally means the one who wrestles with God. And this is the name that God's people have been given since that day forward. I love this metaphor that we are a people who wrestle with God and that we are a people who wrestle with God's word. That we grab a hold of God and we grab a hold of this difficult to understand text and that we don't let it go until we receive God's blessing. This idea of being the one that wrestles with God recognizes that faith is rarely straightforward and easy to understand. That it often takes some give and pull, some wrestling, some time, some questions to understand the deep wisdom contained within its pages. Our God is a relational God and invites this sort of wrestling because This Bible, this sacred text we have been given, is a relational text that we work out through prayer and through conversation as we discuss and debate and tease apart the message that God has for us today. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some of these different stories and the types of stories that the Bible tells that are often difficult to understand Things like war stories and deliverance stories, the gospel stories of the miracles, and wrestling together with this text as we seek to discover what God has to say to us today through it and what good works we're being equipped to do in the world around us. Until that time, I invite you to ponder how the Bible has inspired you throughout your lifetime, throughout your relationship with this text? What does it mean that the Bible is sufficient for teaching and for good works? And allow yourself to be swept up in the awe of this beautiful gift that we have been given together. Amen.